Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted from Command Chapel. One is Gavin. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Wednesday, the 15th of November. Gavin, welcome back to the program. How is your week going so far? Uh, it's very well. I'm a bit tired. Uh, I, I drove from Normandy to England yesterday, and it means getting up at four o'clock in the morning and arriving home about 10 p.m. at night. Um, so it's it's a tiring day. And if I make some more than usual slips of the tongue uh, or say extra stupidities, I hope people will understand. <laughs> I don't know if a lot of people are going to have sympathy for a person who lives in England and has a, a summer cottage in Normandy. I, I, you know, I'm not sure if people are going to give you a little sympathy there. Uh, well, Kevin, I, I'm praying for two countries at once. <laughs> yeah, that's you right. Know, it's, it's double the prayer time. Maybe well, I can earn a bit of sympathy. You probably will, I, and do have sympathy for for me as well. I run an IT company, and all day, all year long, I'll beg my customers for more money for their IT infrastructure. Oh, Kevin, we don't have a penny to offer. Well, November comes along, they have all this extra money, and they put me to work for 80 hours a week trying to get all this money spent on their new infrastructure things, and I don't have time to keep up with it all. And there's just not enough it's, coffee in the world for IT. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard job being a skilled businessman who does IT. You're you're the new magician. You're 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 the piece person that people badly need. Uh, when it all goes pear shaped, we call for people like you, and you you reconnect us to reality. I must admit, sometimes I I walk out of a customer with a messiah complex because when I arrive on location, all hell has broken loose. You've either yes. deleted the grades yeah. for the high school, you know, something's gone bad, and I walk out and all is well, and that, that, that does well for my soul. But, you know, you come to November, December here, I had one customer called up and said, uh, we have $800,000, we need to spend it by December 31st. Oh my goodness. Where were you in January when I was begging for that? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, it's too late. So let's move on to the news. I did a, a wonderful interview with uh, Lorna Ashworth this week. Did you get to watch it? Oh, I certainly did. Absolutely. I watched it with the earliest opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, very impressive. Uh, a great person. Uh, I'm kind of you know sad now to see her not in the Church of England leadership because I think she w was clearly a value-added person. Um, what has been some of the fallback to that? Uh, I just want to say, Kevin, that different people will take away different uh, phrases or words from the interview. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that struck me and I went away almost reeling over was when she said that, that last year in July, uh, at the Synod, where they took these two debates on uh, on gender, it seemed for her that the light went out. I've heard this so often in the last six months. Um, people from different perspectives have said, uh, it's, it's, it's as if the glory of the Lord has departed. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, um, those who stay in the Church of England and work in the Church of England will say, well, you know, you lot would say that, wouldn't you? It, it, you know, it kind of... Um, it, it explains why you're saying what we're saying. But the answer is just because it explains why we're saying what we're saying doesn't make it untrue. And the more people who uh, perceive it and see it, the, the greater the sense that this is this is something real that's happening. Uh, there is a sense in which the Church of England is moving outside a sense of the of of the presence of God. And I, you know, that's why Lorna said she wasn't going to put her time and effort into that part of the Church of England, but instead put it into a local parish where, as far as she's concerned, the gospel is still preached and the kingdom of heaven is still a possibility for people. But I think that, and I hope it'll happen during our conversation, that we'll be able to explain that there are two different religious communities here. One is rooted in Christ and has a right to ask for the Holy Spirit, and the other increasingly is not, and therefore it's no surprise when the glory disappears. And, you know, that's where we come to, you people, schism, schism. Well, you guys say schism or something like that. We say schism. And, uh, <laughs> and, it's because our dentistry isn't as good as yeah, yours. Fair, and something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's all schism. And I'm like, well, at, at some point, the church stops becoming a church 
what what do I do? You know, do I do I stick with it because now it's you know a Rotary Club, uh, it's a you know a Lions Club or something like that where just uh, like-minded people to get together. It no longer preaches the gospel. What am I as an individual to do in that situation? And luckily, the ch- the the old church chose to throw me out. I didn't have to make the decision. But some people just say, I'm done. You know, I'm well, done. one of the things that you hear people saying a lot is, uh, "I didn't leave; they left me," yeah. uh, and 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 one can prove it because the changes in the way in what the church believes and how the church relates to ethical issues have been really quite severe. The church has changed, the Episcopal Church and the, and the Church of England over the last thirty or forty years, and in in those changes, um, they have left those of us who who understand our relationship with the Trinity through the Bible. So last week, uh, Lorna puts out her resignation letter and all the Church of England had to do was keep quiet, just move on, and it wouldn't have been a big thing. Instead, they respond, oh, we're, we're going to miss her. She was a great person. And then we find the publication of transgender ga- uh, guidelines uh, prefaced by Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. And I'm reading through this and I'm like, they really missed it they don't get it they don't know why lorna left and um they're they're heading outside of christianity so quickly it's it's a cult well let's let's keep justin wilby's preface to transgenderism up our sleeves for the end sure. for our yeah. last paragraph of the show because uh, it it will it'll be the, the last paragraph that um, will explain most clearly the consequences of what we're talking about um, bef- before that happened, one of the interesting things was the way in which the British press got hold of the Lorna Ashworth story. Now, normally the British press are only interested in when a, a, a vicar runs off with his church warden or embezzles money. Um, you know, th- then they get religion big time. But um, one of the few exceptions was that the, the London Times has a, uh, a columnist called Melanie Phillips. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she's she's Jewish. She's an intellectual. She's she's uh, middle right. I mean, if everyone on the left says everybody's extreme right over here, it's what they you know you cannot use the word right without extreme. But she's kind of just middle of 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 uh, the right political spectrum. But she's an intellectual, and she has been writing about the flaws in secular culture for some time. And and this week she chose to write about Lorna Ashworth and. Another man called Joshua Sutcliffe, who will come to as well. Joshua is a maths teacher in Oxford. uh, And he was uh, suspended from teaching maths because of a problem he had uh, with transgenderism. Well, he didn't have the problem. The school had the problem. But we'll come to that. Melanie Phillips wrote this article about Lorna Ashworth saying uh, her leaving ought to warn the Church of England that they are going on a trajectory that will involve in self-destruction. Mm-hmm. And she tried to explain in a, in a very succinct paragraph that secularism is no friend of Christianity. And um, it, it's a bit like um, the English, the Saxons and, and Danegelt. When the Vikings moved across to, uh, to, to the east part of England, a few Saxons decided, well, we'll just pay them money to go away or to be quiet. And they didn't foresee that they would want more money and more money. And in the end, they take the money and still not go away and be quiet. And this is the relationship of Christianity to secularism. Uh, the, the, the progressive Christians are trying to make friends with secularism. And they haven't grasped that in the end, secularism is very happy to take Christianity hostage and to neuter it because in the end it wants it destroyed and out of the public place. Now, Melanie Phillips tried to explain this and said that Justin Welby ought to be very worried by Lorna Ashworth's uh, resignation because only traditionalist Christians can keep the church um, on track uh, and safe from being gobbled up by secularism. And she gave us an example, the fate of Joshua Sutcliffe, the maths teacher. He was teaching maths and there were some girls in his class, two girls in particular, uh, one of them was in the process of chance drendering uh, and s- saw herself as having become a he. Um, he made the mistake of saying, well done, girls, <laughs> collectively to them. <laughs> well, what he should have said was, well done, girl, and transgendering person. I'm not even sure if that would have saved him. Anyway, uh, he was, her mother, the mother complained, and the injustice was he was immediately suspended from his work um, and 
uh, he's a Christian, he's actually a pastor in Evangelical Fellowship. Uh, he had done everything right except use the insisting, insisted pronoun that the transgendering person, uh, boy, as she wants to be known as, uh, wanted to call herself by. Um, so Robert Gagnon has been talking, writing about this, uh, and quite clearly, to everybody except the Church of England hierarchy, this is where the cookie crumbles. This is what happens uh, when uh, Orthodox Christians are faced with a competing philosophy that takes no prisoners. And that's the big thing. We say, oh, we need to have radical conclusion. We need to have good discussion. And, well, yeah, that's all fine and good, but at, at a certain point, we're dealing with definitions. I don't know if you you probably do, you're, you're a young guy like me, but back in the 60s and 70s, it was easier to have a conversation with the progressives within the church because we always kept with the same definitions. They would say, well, instead of you know believing in salvation and all that stuff, they would tell you exactly what they believed uh, based on the definition. I don't believe in Jesus Christ, but you're a bishop. Yeah, don't worry about that. You know, and but now, they've rewritten the definitions so that they can believe in Jesus Christ, who was just a teacher, you know? And uh, I think that's one of the bigger things is we both share the right words, but we have the wrong definitions. Or they had they had the wrong definitions, not us. (laughs) (laughs) Told you, not enough coffee. <laughs> I have a, I have a confession to make, and that is that during my 23 years lecturing in a university, I lectured in the psychology of religion. I fell under the spell of Carl Gustav Jung, ah. uh, and uh, as time went by, I found myself becoming a Jungian, uh, because one of the things Jung does is to offer you a, a spirituality that looks like Christianity, but but it gives you things that you quite like. Um, and Jung deliberately smuggled his, his sort of psycho-spirituality into Christianity, knowing that, that parasitically he would get to take over one day. And one of the things that's happened in the last 40 years is the way in which our whole culture has become Jungian. And I just wanted to, to give a couple of signs of that so people can see what that means. You, Jung thought that um, the main goal of human life was individuation. Uh, he talked about God a lot, and everyone says, he was a wonderful man. On BBC Two, one day in 1963, he was asked if he believed in God. He said, I don't need to believe, I know, in this kind of Gnostic way. But, but you see, we're just at the point that you were at, when what he meant by God was not the God of Abraham and Jacob and, and the Holy Trinity. He meant the emerging self inside. Um, self as opposed to ego. Self is a kind of good person. The self for Jung was was the individuated human being who was the synthesis of a whole load of what otherwise would stay opposites. So now this is what Jungianism looks like. First of all, it's the development of the full potential of the self. Now whenever you see uh, anyone writing about people coming into their full potential, they usually mean it in the sense that Jung means it. The self, God, the most important thing. And then the next thing, that, well, if you, go on. Jungianism is kind of the, the halfway point between Joel Olstein and the Force from Star Wars. Yes. You know, it, uh, it's your no, potential. No, the, force, the Force is absolutely. Yeah. The, the whole load of culture is, ba- is based on, on the development of your potential. Yep. It has been for 30 years. We, we, even Christians slip into using it, but um, the the sub Christian people mean it in an idolatrous sense, mm-hmm. and, and Jung in that sense was idolatrous. The next two things they want to do, Jung wanted to do, was he wanted some kind of uh, reconciliation between opposites that otherwise fall out and call, cause neuroses, as far as he was concerned. So he wanted the reconciliation, the integration of masculine and feminine, and the integration of good and evil. What evil he called evil the shadow side. You know, the light and the shadow have to make friends and kind of find this dappled relationship in which they don't cause tension and neuroses. Now, if you look at what Justin Welby teaches, <laughs> you'd discover that he's a disciple of Carl Gustav Jung because uh, we find in his public pronouncements he wants the full, and we'll come to this with a transgendered preface, he wants the, the full de- development of, of the potential of everyone, not their salvation, that's the Christian word, potential. And then the whole gender issue, both of homosexuality and its next stage, transsexualism, is this 
uh, wiping out of the God-given distinction of male and female in, in, as we are made in the image of God. And instead, this, this confusing amalgam of a synthesis of, 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 of gender. So what, we, what, what I'm trying to say is that the, uh, while it looks as though Orthodox Christians can sometimes look down on the progressives and say, ho, 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 we're the real Christians and you're not. And then we invite being laughed at, you know, that's the oldest trick in the book. How can you be so proud? The fact is, when you look at, when you analyze the language and the values that the Progressive Church of England and, and tech use, you discover that their understanding of the world is rooted more in Carl Gustav Jung than it is in our Lord Jesus Christ, which is why Lorna Ashworth said, when she stood up in Synod and she says, thus says the Lord, it says in the Bible this, they yawned and they rolled their eyes. They're not interested in the Holy Scripture. They want the integration of opposites and the development of full human potential. I have always believed and have found uh, confirmation in Scripture and through the church uh, and through the, the forefathers of our church that secularism is the enemy to the gospel. When I arrive in situations with which the church says we have to work with, have good disagreement, and be liked by secularism, I think you've lost the edge and maybe lost the church. Well, you have. And of course, one of the things that secularism does is it, is it picks up um, uh, projects that are antithetic to Christianity. And so the, the last part of our, of our story in England, at any rate, is the issuing of guidelines for transgendered children for Church of England schools. Now, um, at one level, um, those who support Justin Welby and his preface say, but you can't be against this because uh, the Archbishop has written against the horror of bullying. Mm -hmm. He wants to take people who are vulnerable and live on the outsides of society and attract bullying and protect them. You know, what terrible people are you to get in the way of the Archbishop protecting the weak and the poor from bullying? So that's one way of presenting it. But of course, it's not telling the truth about the narrative. Uh, what it's first of all doing is it's accepting the basis of transgenderism as if there was nothing more to say about it. I think one of the most helpful parallels I've heard is, is with anorexia. Uh, kids who are suffering from anorexia have, have this uh, distorted and very painful to live with perception. There's something very badly wrong with their bodies. And so they end up by starving themselves close to death and sometimes to death because their mental perception of their relationship between their, who they are and their body is, is badly distorted. And, and, here's same, where, and here's where we agree with society. Yes, their feelings are real, but is that relevant? Yeah. Say that again. You, Skype interrupted us. What is, what, where do we agree with society? I missed it. Oh, you, I, what? you, you didn't hear yeah. that? That was a great, oh my gosh, it was so good. Oh. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh Skype no! Me. I went deaf. <laughs> yeah, Skype edits what I say all the time. Apparently, uh, you, you froze and looked wide, and I knew it was good, but I didn't get to hear it. <laughs> Clearly, it wasn't that wise. Uh, and now I don't even remember what I said. Now, uh, uh, you know, there, there's this reality that what um, anorexic people feel, their feelings, there are real. But the relevance of the realness to their feelings is the is the question. Yes, you feel fat, but the reality is you're not. Do we let you starve yourself together to starve yourself to death based on your feelings? And this is why Jung is important, because mm -hmm. if a whole culture has been persuaded that the self is God, then whatever the self feels, the self has to have. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't contradict uh, the, the self. And so in terms of gender dysphoria, the awful, awful, mental tension is that when someone feels uh, that their way they ought to be is is in terms of gender terms opposite the way their body is well now there are, there are two things you can do here you can either say as you do with anorexics look we need to find some better way of gearing your perception of your body and your mind uh, in a better way in a way that is less destructive or you could say, well, of course, of course, the way you feel is correct. And we'll, well, we'll cut your body up and, we'll, and we will uh, fill you all f full of hormones you were never designed to have in order 
to placate this dis-ease of mind and body. Um, that at least is a conversation that we ought to be having. Instead, when it comes to gender dysphoria, the Church of England has simply accepted the secular narrative and said the self is king or queen, whichever case it is. Uh, and, and we just must make sure people suffering from this aren't bullied. There is no sense that the Christians holding to the Gospels lose their jobs are being bullied. That, that never occurs to the present establishment. Um, but in the end, of course, uh, it's not the bullying that takes place, as if we could somehow produce a world without bullying anyway. Uh, it's the fact that, that this anti-Christian secular narrative is being swallowed wholesale as if it was Christianity. Uh, and it isn't. It's a different religion. I think it was two years ago or last year, and I don't know, I don't live in, in Britain I, or the UK, I don't know this, if it was Sky News or the BBC uh, produced a documentary on transgenderism. And their conclusion in the documentary was it was horrible, do not pursue it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see the documentary? No. No, no, I didn't. No, no, no because they never published it. Uh, it, it, it was canned because of the conclusion. And, you know, that's what we get to is we don't get to see the scientific truth of that. It, it's completely locked out. And now, because of the Church of England, we don't get to see the, the spiritual truth behind it. Um, we are just trying to keep secularism happy so that it will keep us around a little longer. One of the sad things that happened was when Christians were called on to TV and radio, many of them did as good a job as they could. Um, but but, I, I, but they, they, they failed in the sense to say the basis on which you are asking these questions of calling me transphobic or homophobic is entirely illegitimate. Mm -hmm. we, you know, the moment you begin to answer the secular question, you do in a sense what the Church of England has done. You, you accept the validity of their narrative. One of the things we have to say is we can't start there. First of all, um, there are no phobias. <laughs> I mean, we've, I've said this before. <laughs> In, the, the, the notion of a phobia is a half-baked psychotherapeutic idea that people throw around whenever they want to win an argument. You may well have arachnophobia, the fear of, I, of spiders. Right <laughs> I can scream like nobody. But, but, but well, I don't like dentists. But but <laughs> but, but but to take but to take something. Uh, well, again, it, it, arachnophobia is not irrational. It's actually a, a preservation mechanism against yeah. something that could kill you. Um, so um, the, the use of the liberals and the progressives of the term phobia, uh, which is accepted by everybody uh, we, without, without cavil, uh, is one of the things that we, we need to try and sidestep. And I'd like to say any, any sentence you have in which you use the word phobia is not a sentence I can reply to. I don't accept the term. No, and it's fun to watch uh, UK press, especially people like Pierce Morgan. I don't know if you ever uh, get to see him. But half, when he starts losing an argument, he goes right for those words. You're homophobic, you're transphobic, you're racialphobic, you know, and uh, it's just name calling. And at a certain point, we really want to get to the topic. You know, the, the topic here is, as a church, can we offer transformation to the world? You, as a secular society, want to offer affirmation. When the church is offering affirmation, with the seculars offering affirmation, you've lost. It's over. Get out of the swimming pool, towel off, let somebody else have some fun. All right, what is that, 23 minutes? Oh, you guys are so patient out there. We had to go along because, you know, I don't know if we're going to be reporting in the Church of England much longer. It's on a crash, it's, it's a plane falling out of the sky. And, uh, you know, Lorna uh, Ashworth, has not led the way, but she's um, certainly going to start a path of a greater um, momentum of people walking out of the Church of England. Gavin, I want to thank you for your time. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 344 of Anglican Unscripted. And for your patience, God bless you.